question. Uh, before I get started, I, I just want to do a quick conflict of interest disclosure. I am, uh, as was just mentioned, a portfolio manager for a wealth management firm here in Canada, and our firm provides services related to a lot of the things that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, okay, so with that, welcome to the session. Uh, and, and thanks for being here on a, on a Sunday, on a long weekend, on, uh, on Valentine's Day. So the session is, uh, is designed to be a, a broad overview of financial markets, the theory and evidence about how financial markets work, and then based on that theory and evidence, what should we as individual investors be doing to, to interact with them in uh, the most beneficial way possible? Uh, so I'll, I'll get through the content in about, in about 50 minutes, and then we'll have time for questions at the end. All right. So I, I think it's really helpful to understand at a, at a practical level what we're talking about when we talk about stocks and bonds, which are, are words that you may have heard before. When, when a business wants to finance its operations, so this is real businesses that we're talking about as every every stock on the market is a, is a represents a real a real business so when a business wants to finance its operations it may choose to raise capital uh capital will be used to fund various things uh, investments expansions new technologies whatever it may be for the for the business now broadly speaking re really broadly speaking there are two primary ways that a company can raise capital they can sell equity in their business so they're selling off ownership in the company or they can borrow money. So two, two uh, re really polar opposite approaches, either selling off ownership or borrowing money and not giving up any ownership. Now investors, so this is now where we as investors come into the picture. Investors are willing to supply capital to businesses to finance their operations in exchange for a positive expected return. So this is when you think about investing, the whole goal is to earn returns. This is why you earn returns because you're, you're supplying capital to businesses and you're taking risk by, by doing so. Now, when a company raises equity, uh, equity capital, when they sell a portion of their company to raise capital, the investor gets shares or stocks. So th this is where stocks come from. Uh, when, you, when you buy a piece of ownership of a company, the company gets your money, which they can use to, to expand the business or whatever they're going to do and you get a stock. Now, when a company raises capital through debt, the investors get bonds. Bonds are also issued by governments. Actually, most of the bonds that exist in the bond market are government issued. Just like a company raises capital, governments also raise capital uh, and, and they can both do that through bonds. Governments don't sell equity, that, that wouldn't work too well. Um, now, when you own shares in a company, you have fractional ownership of the actual business, of the business's assets and its expected future profits. So in the case of a stock, you're partaking in, in the company's potential upside in the, in the future, but also its potential downside. So I mentioned the word risk a minute ago. This is that. You're supplying capital, but there's no guarantee, especially when it comes to investing in stocks. If a stock that you've invested in does, or a company, the, the company that the stock represents, does unexpectedly well, you might have significantly uh, high returns. And we've seen this in Canada with a company called Shopify over the last few years. Uh, its price has just gone through the roof. You may have heard about Tesla, same, same kind of thing, where the, the share price has just done much better than anybody expected uh, a few uh, years ago. But the same thing can also happen on the other side, where a, a company can do unexpectedly poorly. Um, so if a business does not do well or does worse than investors expected, you can uh, see your investment decline or in the worst case scenario, if a company goes out of business, you can actually lose everything. Uh, bonds, as opposed to stocks, you've lent money to the company. That's where the company raised debt capital. The company is going to pay you interest throughout the term of the loan. Usually a bond will have a, well, they can have all sorts of different maturities. It might be a five-year loan, a 10-year loan, a 30-year loan. Uh, anyway, so throughout the term of the, of the bond, the company is going to pay you interest payments. And at the end of the term, they're going to give you your principal back. So whatever you loaned them originally, at the end of the loan term, you're going to get that back. Now, in the case of the bond, so if you're a bond investor, um, I just talked about Shopify and Tesla. 
they've done extremely well in terms of their share price and their and their underlying business over the last few years. If you were a bond holder, if you had lent money to one of these companies, while their stock price has taken off, your bond investment would not have changed. Um, you'd still be getting the same interest payments. You'd still expect to get your principal back at the end of the term. Um, on the flip side, if the company has that, that you've lent money to uh, through through the bond issuance does really poorly, likewise, you're going to continue getting your interest payments and your principal back at the end of the term. If the company goes out of business, whereas with a stock investment, you can lose everything. With a bond investment, um, you're, you're a creditor. So you actually may have, and in most cases, a bondholder would have a claim on the company's assets in uh, bankruptcy proceedings. So if we kind of summarize these, these two broad asset categories, stocks and bonds, stocks are riskier, um, but they've also got more potential upside. Uh, another way to say that is that stocks have higher expected returns to compensate for the fact that they are riskier investments. Bonds, on the other hand, are safer and they have correspondingly lower expected uh, returns. I mean, you can think about it as a, for your, yourself as an investor, to compel you to invest in a riskier investment, you must expect a higher return. And it's just a, it, it would be irrational to do uh, otherwise. So in the long run, financial markets have rewarded long-term investors. They've been an important part of, of the economy uh, as a whole. Uh, and importantly for, for our purposes, and we're going to talk more about this in a minute, uh, they've, they've allowed us to increase our wealth in excess, us being the collective body of investors, uh, increase our wealth in excess of inflation in the long run. So we can see in this chart a depiction of stock growth, growth of wealth invested in stocks, growth of wealth invested in government bonds, so safe bonds. Remember I said a company can issue bonds, a government can issue bonds. Governments tend to be safer uh, investments than corporations. And so just like the relationship I was just describing, the expected returns on government bonds are lower than they are on corporate bonds. So anyway, we can see in this image here um, from 1985 through 2018, uh, safe government bonds, they outpace inflation by a bit, not by a ton. But look at the shape of the line, and this is important. It's very smooth when we look at the returns of the bonds. They, they've increased fairly steadily over time, which is kind of what you'd expect based on what I just described in terms of their mechanics. And then you can see the blue area, which is representing stocks. The growth of wealth has been much more extreme than it has with the safer investments, but the path to getting there has been a lot bumpier. And we're, we're gonna talk more about that as we go, as we go through uh, the talk. Now, most of us as individual investors uh, aren't directly involved with the process that I, that I introduced. So that, that practical aspect of companies raising money for their operations and that, that's where stocks and bonds originate from. We're not usually involved with that process. That's usually done by large financial institutions called investment banks. Uh, they're the ones that underwrite the issues of stocks and bonds. But us as individual investors become very important on something called the secondary market. So that initial stock or bond issuance is called the primary market. The secondary market is where stocks and bonds trade once they've been created. Now, the primary market needs the secondary market. It relies on it uh, because that's where prices ultimately get set for the stocks and bonds. And it's also a major source of liquidity. If, if a, an investment bank didn't think anybody on the secondary market would be interested in investing in a company's stock, then they're not going to help the company raise capital in the primary market, or, or they're going to tell them to raise capital at a much lower um, uh, price point for their, for their company in the primary market. Um, so once the stocks and bonds exist on the, on the secondary market, if I think uh, that a stock is going to do really well in the future, I might be willing to buy it from someone who doesn't think it's going to do as well. I might be willing to pay more for it than the seller thinks that it's worth. So that in that case, the buyer and the seller are going to meet at the share price 
that reflects their respective beliefs. And that's how a transaction takes place. I mean, you can think about it in a- any transaction that you can imagine. This is how it happens. A buyer and a seller uh, meet at a price that they, uh, that they find mutually fair. Um, now, when you think about this in the context of the stock and bond markets, the, the process of trading results in information being reflected in prices because the buyer and the seller are showing up to the transaction. They each have their views and beliefs about the future of, of the company that they're uh, looking to trade in. And by acting on those views and beliefs, they're impounding the information that they have into the prices. And this becomes really important in terms of how we approach the market. So we're going we're gonna to talk more about that in a moment. Um, but that, that, that information uh, aggregating effect or, or mechanism that, that the market ends up uh, providing is, is extremely important. Uh, markets are relatively low cost to transact with. Um, they process billions of dollars worth of trades every single day. So the, the amount of information that they're aggregating is, is tremendous. Uh, it's, it's a very efficient information aggregating machine. Now, the other way to think about this is that at, at any given point in time, we can look at the price of a stock and know that there is a lot of information that's already in there. And if you have that belief that, uh, that prices contain information, that will affect the way that you yourself may want to invest in the stock market. There's a, uh, a, a 2004 book titled The Wisdom of Crowds. Um, you may have heard of that, of the term, but the, the author in the book explores cases where large groups of humans are smarter, a lot smarter, than even the smartest individuals. And in the book, the author describes, based on his research, a wise crowd, as he calls them, needs to have diversity of opinion, independence from each other, decentralization, and a good uh, method for aggregating opinions. So if we think about this in the context of the stock market, it it checks all of those boxes. Um, And I'm gonna explain the jelly beans in a second. There, there, there's a, an anecdote in the book um, referred to as the parable of the ox. And it's a story about the statistician Francis Galton, who observed a competition at a, at a county fair where there were about 800 people that participated in this, in this contest to guess the weight of an ox. And this is in 1906 that this happened. And he actually got his hands on the data uh, on, on all of the guesses that people had placed. And he found that while there was a wide range of guesses, the average guess was very, very close, scary close to the actual weight of the ox. Now I've done this experiment with jelly beans. I didn't have uh, an ox handy, Uh, but I've done this with jelly beans with groups of about 50 people um, on three separate occasions. And every time it, 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 it completely blows my mind, but it's, you see the exact effect that Galton observed where this group of people asked to place independent guesses about the number of jelly beans in a jar without fail. Uh, well, maybe not always without fail, but uh, uh, th- there's a good chance that the the average guess is going to end up being very close to the actual number of or quantity of whatever whatever the thing is that you're trying to guess the the measurement of. Now, with stocks, this becomes really important because unlike an ox, which we can weigh, or jelly beans, which we can count, the value of a company is fairly subjective. But if there's, if markets are good at aggregating information and if crowds are wise when they're set up properly, which financial markets do, do seem to facilitate, then we can be fairly confident that the price that we observe for a stock listed on the financial markets is pretty well the best, the best depiction of the company's actual value that we can get. And I mentioned the volume of trading being high. Uh, in, in 2019, on average per day, there's $443 billion worth of uh, trading volume per day. So when I say it's a, it's a massive quantity of information being impounded into prices, it, I mean, it is, it's huge. And one of, the, one of the really important components of this 
trading uh, is that it's it's coming from a lot of the trades, even the majority of trades are being placed by large institutions. Now, a, an individual can go online and do research and, and try to do their best to get information. Institutions tend to have better access to information. Information costs a lot of money. I mean, like a, a Bloomberg terminal, which is a financial research terminal, um, costs like $10,000 a month or something like that just to access all of the financial data that it contains. So most individuals don't have that. Most institutions have, you know, 10 uh, Bloomberg terminals in the office. Um, so the, the, the reason that's important is that it's not just the quantity of trading, but it's also the quality of the information that's being impounded into prices. So all of this ties back to the, to the comment that I've made a couple of times, which is that we really care when we think about how we should invest our money we really care whether market prices are correct or incorrect. And I'll, I'll explain in a sec why that matters to, to the way that you might want to invest your, your, your own money. Now, I, we, we briefly referenced the idea of inflation and uh, the idea that stocks tend to have higher uh, returns historically and they have higher expected returns than bonds. But I think it's, it's really important to tie it back to why this is practically relevant to us as, as individual investors. Um, in, in last week's session, uh, Dr. Steph pointed out that there are two approaches to increasing your net worth. And I totally agree with her. I mean, it's, it's math. You can't, you can't disagree with this. Uh, if, if you want to increase your net worth, you can spend less money or you can make more money. I mean, that's, that's, that's it. Um, now making more money though, and, and Dr. Steph mentioned this too, making more money can come from working more hours, uh, or increasing the amount of money that you can make per unit of your time. But it can also come from investing. Over time, we convert our human capital, so the, the labor income that you can make from working, we convert that over time into financial capital, which is our ability to earn income, income by supplying capital to the financial markets. Not investing the income that you earn through your human capital uh, will generally reduce your purchasing power over time. So you can see in my example here, if you took $10,000 30 years ago and left it in cash, it's roughly lost half of its uh, purchasing power. So st stuff gets more expensive over time. And if you just hold cash, well, the cash will lose purchasing power. And that's, it's just a side effect of the way that our, that our economy uh, functions. Now, investing in something very safe, like a savings account or a guaranteed investment certificate, that might help you or, or might let you keep up with inflation. Um, in some cases, maybe even ret earn returns in excess of inflation. If you look at savings accounts right now, they're earning maybe 0.5% if you're, if you're lucky. But at the same time, expected inflation is, is very low um, right now. Uh, so the, the point there is if you take very little risk, you might keep pace with inflation. You might maintain your purchasing power but you're not going to expect to earn uh, significant returns. Um, in, investing in stocks is where that expected return piece starts to become quite significant, not risk-free, which is important. You're, you're taking risk by investing in stocks. But when we think about the practical relevance of this, the, the more return that you can earn with your capital, the less that you need to earn, earn with your labor income to achieve the same financial outcome. I'll, I'll try and make that even more practical. If, if you have a goal to be financially independent by some time, the more that you can earn with your, uh, when, when the, the more that you earn on your investments, so the, the higher rate of return that you earn on your um, financial capital, the sooner you can reach your financial independence goal, the less you have to rely on your human capital. Uh, so it, it, it should be obvious why this, why this is really important. The higher return you can earn, the less... Uh, pressure you have on your human capital to be able to fund your future consumption. Um, but it's also important to know that this is not risk-free. If, uh, if, if, if there were no risk in earning these high returns and everybody would earn them and we would have inflation to the point where price is normalized. But because it's risky, not everybody wants to take risk. Not everybody can take risk with their financial capital, but for those of us who can, there are positive expected returns to be earned. Okay. 
So we've touched on structurally what financial markets are, how supplying capital to them can earn us positive expected returns. And I've tried to give an overview of how information gets aggregated into prices and why that might matter to us as investors. So now, now we're really going to take a bit of a deep dive into that, into that piece. In, in broad terms, there are two ways that we can think about investing in financial markets. And this is really broad terms. So this is, this is as broad as it gets. And I'm not even that crazy about these two definitions, but they are the broadest approaches to investing in financial markets. You can take an active approach. So an, an active approach means that you're going to guess and predict which stocks to hold and when to hold them. Now, this approach implicitly assumes that you have better information than the market. It assumes that all the wisdom of crowd stuff that we just talked about doesn't really work. And that despite all the information that should be contained in prices, you actually have an informational advantage, which you can act on to make profits. So that, that, that's, that's what active investing means. It, it's taking the position that prices are wrong. And because you have the missing piece of information, you can earn uh, excess returns. The, the alternative uh, is, is called a passive approach. Now, again, I'm not crazy about the term passive because it sounds like you're not doing anything. It's got a bit of a negative connotation. Uh, if you're not familiar with, uh, with, with the, the term and its use in the context of investing, but it, it, what it means is buying a cross section of all of the stocks that are available to buy. So instead of guessing and predicting um, which stocks to buy, and instead of assuming that you have better information than the market, the passive investing approach implicitly assumes that prices do contain accurate information about the risk and expected return of stocks. And there, there's no need to disagree with prices. The, the optimal portfolio, um, the optimal portfolio is the market because prices contain accurate information. Now to do, to do that, uh, active investing, you can buy an actively managed mutual fund. You can pick stocks on your own. Passive investing uh, can be accomplished. And this is a, I mean, not a really new innovation. Index funds have been around since the 1970s. But in terms of their broad uptake by the investing public, they're relatively new. Uh, the, the share of assets in passive index funds has been relatively low until maybe the last 10 years. They've really started to, to take off and investors have started to understand why they make sense. Um, so passive investing can be accomplished with an index fund. Now, what is an index fund? Even bigger step back, what is an index? An index is a grouping of stocks that's been assembled uh, usually by a financial research company to be a representation of a market. So there can be an index for the Canadian market, and, and there is. It's called the S&P TSX Composite Index. You may have heard of it. Um, that's a, an index that represents the Canadian stock market. So uh, S&P and the TSX get together. They look at all the stocks that exist in the Canadian stock market. They assign stock names, so th this company, and a weight. This company makes up this portion of the Canadian stock market. And they basically publish that as a list. Um, and, and then that list is used by fund companies, companies that create financial products to make an index fund. So they don't have to do much. They just take the list and they buy the stocks in the list. And then you as an investor can buy that uh, as, a, as an investment. Uh, indexes also exist for the US. You may have heard of the S&P 500. That's another uh, major index. There are also global indexes. Um, there's actually, it's, it's kind of interesting. There, there are more indexes uh, than there are stocks that exist in the world. And that's a whole other problem because it gets confusing for investors, which index should you buy? Um, but anyway, that's a, that's a whole other rabbit hole. So for now, two broad approaches, you can disagree with the market and invest actively to try and earn excess returns, or you can agree with the market in terms of its ability to price stocks and bonds. And if you agree with the market, you, you accept the prices, you don't try and outguess what's going to happen in the future and you accept the returns of the market. And that can be accomplished using low cost index funds. Now, whether you would do one of these or the other. So I've talked about how it, it, it likely makes sense to believe prices are right. Uh, mar market prices are right. And that, we'll touch more on that in a second. Um, 
if you believe prices are wrong, if you, if you believe that you can invest actively to earn extra returns, if you can do that, you, you, you obviously would. But there's this really important concept called the arithmetic of active management that I want to touch on. Uh, this is from a famous paper, famous in my world anyway, a famous 1991 paper in the Financial Analyst Journal by a guy named William Sharp. He's an American economist who won the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in 1990 for his work on how the market prices stocks. So this paper, The Arithmetic of Active Management, he lays out very plain and simply that there's one universe of stocks, which is true. There's one universe of stocks. So on average, active funds own the same stocks as passive funds. On average, all of the active funds own the whole market and all of the passive funds own the whole market. And that, that has to be true mathematically. Uh, now, before costs, if what I just said is true, and, and it is, before costs, um, active and passive funds have the same, will have the same return. They have to, because on average, they all own the same, uh, they all own the same market. Costs become really important in this arithmetic of active management discussion. Before costs, active and passive investing strategies had the same expected returns. After costs, actively managed funds or active management in general, even if you're doing your own, your own stock picking, incurs higher costs. And those costs might come in the form of research costs, the cost of getting information that allows you to disagree with the market to try and earn an extra profit. But they can also come from transaction costs where if you're disagreeing with the market all the time and uh, that, that requires trading, trading has a cost and that, that, that is reflected in your, in your after cost uh, returns. So before costs, active and passive funds should have the same returns. After costs, passive funds should have lower, uh, higher returns uh, because active investing has higher overall costs. Now, that, that's true and important, but costs are only half of the argument. There's this fascinating empirical observation that's been known for a long time in financial markets. It was formalized in a couple of papers recently uh, in 2017 and 2019 and updated in 2020. Uh, these papers from a guy named Hendrik Bessembender um, at Arizona State University. He found in, in a study of US stocks from 1926 through 2016, these numbers are staggering. He found that 4% of the stocks that existed in the US stock market over that full time period were responsible for all of the net wealth creation in the market. So that, I mean, that's pretty crazy. 4% 4, 4 of stocks that existed were responsible for all of the net wealth creation. And then his later study, more recent study, looked at global stocks from 1990 through mid 2020 and it was actually even more extreme. 1.5% of global stocks were responsible for the net wealth creation uh, in excess of US treasury bills. In, in, in both cases, it was in excess of uh, US treasury bills are like a very, very low risk bond. So you know, in order to do better than the risk-free investment in both cases, um, you had to, it, the, the, the return was explained by uh, the wealth creation to be more specific, was explained by this tiny fraction of stocks. So when we think about the arithmetic of active management, uh, that, that is still true. But when we say average in the context of the arithmetic of active management, we're really talking about the mean average. And when you think about the skewness in individual stock returns that I just mentioned, the median average probably becomes more, uh, more relevant. So the, the, the mean active fund is going to underperform by costs, by the difference in cost between active and passive. The median fund is going to do much worse because there's such a high chance um, uh, of any given actively managed fund missing out on those best performing stocks, which increases the odds of them underperforming, of the median fund underperforming. Now, this, uh, the flip side of the skewness, I guess, is that some actively, fund, actively managed funds might do really well. Um, but the chances of picking that fund ahead of time are extremely low. So between the skewness and individual stock returns and just the nature of active management, um, 
by definition, basically, you're not owning all of the stocks in the market as an active manager. Uh, so because of that skewness in stock returns, there's a high chance of missing the best performing stocks. And then the high costs of active management show up intact as lower after cost returns to investors. Now, if we look at this empirically, like, okay, I'm saying that active funds probably aren't going to be able to beat uh, a passive index fund most of the time. Um, and this is easy, easy to verify empirically. So this is data from a study that comes out twice a year from Standard & Poor's, which is the same financial research company that I mentioned a minute ago. They, they make the S&P TSX uh, index. They publish this report twice a year where they compare actively managed funds in a given country. In this case, it's for Canada. They compare actively managed funds. So an actively managed fund is a fund where there's an active manager and they're saying on behalf of the people that invest in this fund, I'm going to perform active management um, trades uh, in an effort to do better than the index. Now, how do they actually do? That's the important empirical question to ask. Over five-year periods, even over one-year periods, it's just it's more extreme over five-year periods, um, the vast majority, over 90% of actively managed funds underperform uh, a, a relevant index benchmark. Now, this is practitioner literature. It's not uh, peer-reviewed academic research. You could argue maybe there's a conflict in there because this is a company that also creates indexes. And they're saying, look, the active funds can't beat the indexes that we create. Uh, so to balance that out, there's a massive body of academic literature on this topic. Um, one notable paper from 2010 published in the Journal of Finance uh, is titled Luck versus Skill in the Cross-Section of Mutual Fund Returns. And this paper asked the question, uh, do, do actively managed funds show any statistical evidence of an ability to outperform their passive counterparts? And the data in the study suggests that few funds produce benchmark adjusted expected returns sufficient to cover their costs. So ex ex exactly what you'd expect uh, based on the, the points that I just mentioned. Now, this is really tricky from the perspective of the individual investor. And it's really tricky because all of the data that I just mentioned, but both the, the Standard & Poor's study and the, the academic paper, uh, but both of those had data that has been corrected for survivorship bias. If you walk into a bank branch um, or sit down with a financial advisor or whatever it may be, they're, the, the funds that they show you are always going to be funds that currently exist. Obviously, because they're not going to tell you to invest in a fund that doesn't exist anymore. Why is that a problem? It's a problem because surviving funds, the funds that exist at a given point in time, they survived by performing well. Okay. That's good, I guess. We, we want funds that have performed well. Um, so they perform well, they attract investors' assets. Losing funds, on the other hand, funds that don't do well, they don't attract assets or they may even lose their clients' assets and eventually they'll close they'll close down. The challenge though, is that the funds that did well, and I said, oh, we want to invest in funds that have done well. That's, that's not actually true. Um, we don't. Um, f funds that have done well, it's, it's really hard to say whether funds that have done well historically did well because the fund manager was lucky or if they were skilled. Now, a lucky fund manager can have great returns, even for a long period of time, this can happen. But once that's happened, and we look at their past returns and say, yes, I want to invest in that fund. If they were just lucky, there's, there's no reason to believe, no reasonable reason to believe that their, that their luck is going to persist. If they're skilled, if we can identify a manager and say, okay, this is a truly skilled manager. And if we know that with certainty, then maybe there's a better chance that they're going to continue to do well in the future. So this is important because when you're sitting down looking at a list of funds that have survived, you can't say whether the survival was due to luck or skill. Now that question, luck versus skill, has been studied um, pretty extensively. So an another paper in the Journal of Finance by Mark Carhart, it's a 1997 paper uh, titled On Persistence in Mutual Fund Performance. He, based on the research that he did, found that there, there's, there's no evidence to support the existence of skilled or informed 
mutual fund portfolio managers. So in other words, the, in his sample, the successful managers were lucky rather than skilled. And the, the previous paper that I mentioned, um, they were actually looking at a pretty similar question and found a, a, a very similar result. Now, it's actually even worse than, uh, it, it's worse than randomness. Like if you invest in a fund that's done well historically, the future outcome is not randomly bad. It's worse than that. Um, there, there's evidence of a negative correlation between past fund success and future success for active funds. Now, the theory on this is a little bit split. It might be because the funds were just lucky and the lucky managers revert to the mean. Um, so therefore, the, the future returns of funds have done well in the past tend to be lower. The other theory, which I find fascinating, is that managers may actually be skilled. Fund managers may be skilled. But when a fund manager does well, investors give them their money to manage. So the fund grows larger. And another empirically known fact is that active funds have decreasing returns to scale. That means that as an actively managed fund grows in size, it gets harder for the manager to continue to generate uh, strong returns. So if we make the assumption that managers are actually skilled or that some managers are actually skilled, uh, investing in their funds is, is still not a guarantee of, uh, of, of future success because if they've had strong past returns, the assets flow into their fund, making it harder for them to produce strong returns in the future. So between these two possible explanations, um, well, they're, they're, those are two explanations of the empirical fact, which is that funds that have done well in the past tend to do not well in the future. Um, but if you go and sit down with most financial advisors that are selling actively managed funds anyway, um, past, past performance, even re recent past performance is often used to sell. Um, and without knowing about survivorship bias, and the data surrounding it and then the, the, the theory about funds that have done well historically. I think it's really hard for investors to believe all of the other things that I've just told you. Um, I can say active funds don't beat the market. You sit down at a bank branch and they show you 10 funds from, their, from, from the bank's active manager that have beaten the market <laughs> without understanding um, survivorship bias. I think that can make uh, good decision making really, really hard. So everything that we've been talking about so far can be and, and has been summarized in a theoretical framework for how financial markets function. So this is known as the efficient market hypothesis, EMH for short. Uh, Eugene Fama, who's uh, an economist at the University of Chicago, he won the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in 2013 for his work on this theory. And he started that work in the 1960s. So the efficient market hypothesis uh, basically just says that, well, actually you can see it in the, in the slide here. Um, it says that at, at any time, prices fully reflect all available information. A market in which prices fully reflect available information is called efficient. If the market is efficient, the theory makes a few, uh, quite a few testable predictions. Um, uh, a, a handful of them are that prices should move randomly because if you think about it at, at a point in time, if information, all available information is in prices at a point in time, the only way that the prices are going to move is based on new information developing and new information is by definition random unless you can predict the future, which most people uh, can't. Another prediction that the model makes that the efficient market hypothesis model makes is that active managers should not be successful at beating the market persistently. And we've just reviewed the evidence on that. They, they don't tend to. Uh, and then an, another easily testable one is that prices should change quickly based on new information. And this has been studied by something called event studies, where we, we look in the historical data uh, for an event that we know happened. Uh, we can look back and see how do prices react to that event. And in those event studies, it looks like markets tend to uh, react very efficiently to new information. So for, for most investors, markets aren't perfectly efficient. And that's, that's important. Um, mar market efficiency is a theory. Uh, it, it's, it's an academic model. It's not reality. Real markets can't be perfectly efficient because of transaction costs and individual preferences and 
irrational behavior, uh, taxes even, those can all be impediments to the, the theoretically perfectly efficient market. But uh, real markets probably, and in the data, look like they approach efficiency. So even though they're not perfectly efficient, and even though market efficiency is just a model, it probably makes sense. I think it makes sense for investors to treat the market as if it were efficient. And if we believe that to be true, then this, this idea of using low cost index funds to passively capture market returns as opposed to trying to beat them is easily hands down the most sensible approach to investing. Now, the next big question that investors have to ask themselves is what their portfolio should look like. So if we've gotten past this idea of picking stocks or picking actively managed funds to try and beat the market and settled on, okay, let's use index funds. You have to ask, what's your mix between stocks and bonds? We've talked about stocks being riskier and bonds being safer, but what is risk is a, is a really uh, important question. Uh, academically speaking, risk, and this is a bit jargony, so excuse, excuse that, but um, ri risk is defined as the discount rate that's applied to, uh, applied to future cash flows. That's the, in an academic sense. So relative to their future cash flows, bonds are going to have higher prices than stocks. Um, you're, you're paying more for the expected future cash flows from a bond um, because you, you're, you've got more certainty about getting those future cash flows. So your expected return is, is lower. Now with stocks, you're, you're paying less for the future cash flows because they're riskier. You don't know if you're going to get them uh, or, or, or not. So from that, if you do get the cash flows expected, then you get a higher expected return. So again, jargony, I know, but that's the academic definition for risk not the best definition for an individual investor with a, with a long time horizon um, and, and human capital, the ability to earn income from their, from their labor. And, and then the, the other important piece there in, in framing risk for stocks and bonds is that over very long periods of time, stocks have actually had really reliable outcomes. Short, short term, they're volatile, lots of price fluctuations. Uh, long term, pretty reliable outcomes. So I, I would even venture to say that for a long-term investor with say a 30 year time horizon who don't have any human tendencies, and I'll elaborate that on that in a second, um, I'm willing to say that stocks are less risky than bonds over very long time periods. And that may seem like an extreme statement, but I don't think it is. Now, my comment about humans. Humans are not so good at handling price fluctuations in their financial assets. Um, and, and if, if price fluctuations in your financial assets compel you to do something, for example, sell your portfolio or stop contributing to your portfolio, that changes, that action, that, that human action changes the volatility uh, from being something that's just kind of noise in, in the short term and somewhat irrelevant in the long term. Uh, it changes it into a real economic risk. Because if prices drop, if stock prices drop and you sell your portfolio at the bottom of a drop, you're, you're locking in your losses. So I, I can say that stocks are less risky than bonds over long time horizons, but you have to be able to stick. You have to be able to stick with the investment, which again, we know from the data, people are not so good at, uh, at doing that. So to, to generalize on this topic, I think for longer time horizons, you have a higher allowable allocation to stocks. It, it's reasonable to allocate more to stocks. Um, and you can even go in some cases higher than 100% in stocks by using borrowed money to, to invest. That's a whole other discussion, but it's possible. But importantly, a higher allowable allocation to stocks is not the same thing as a higher tolerable allocation to stocks. For some people, volatility can be very stressful um, and I'm like really stressful. Like it can keep you up at night. It can make people physically sick. So just because you have a long time horizon and, and a stable income doesn't mean you should. It means you can. It doesn't mean you should be in a, in a very aggressive portfolio. Now, to help make these decisions, there are some online tools from companies like Vanguard, which is a company that makes uh, index funds and other investment products. So they, if you just Google search Vanguard risk assessment tool, they have a free online a uh, questionnaire that can help you determine your asset allocation, but I'd only use something like that as one input. And I'll talk about why. 
uh, I, me I mentioned psychological prefer preferences when we're thinking about how much risk to take. W one of the other, one of the other really, arguably the biggest input, or at least one of them, um, and it's related to time horizon. It's related to how long you have to invest your money. Is, is the characteristics of your human capital. So, in the case of physicians, speaking generally. Um, I, I think it's safe to say that they'll have safe, stable, valuable, um, and ho hopefully properly insured human capital. That gives you the capacity to take more risk with your investments compared to someone like me. My job is close, very closely tied to the stock market. Um, so if, if the stock market does bad, it affects my, my human capital for a physician that is probably less true where if the stock market is doing poorly, um, physicians generally may be less affected than someone like me. So that, that relationship between your financial capital and your human capital is an extremely important consideration in deciding on your mix between stocks and, and bonds. Debt also factors into this. And it's another reason why those risk questionnaires are not always uh, perfect on an, on the individual level. I like to think about debt as negative bonds. You're kind of the bond issuer in the case of debt. Uh, the bank owns the asset. You've, you've sold the asset. You've sold the safe asset to the bank. So if you have debt and bonds at the same time, they, they kind of cancel each other out. Um, so anyway, that, that's a bit of a rabbit hole that we could go down. But generally speaking, you, you wouldn't want to borrow money to invest in uh, bonds. It's a bit of a complex topic. I've got a YouTube video on this that you can check out uh, after the session if you're interested in um, a more robust way to think through that, that piece of it. Okay. So how to invest active versus passive, mix between stocks and bonds. The next big piece is where do you, where do, you do this? Where, which accounts do you actually invest the money in? In Canada, I'm just going to do a quick overview. Um, in Canada, we, for retirement purposes, there are other accounts for other purposes. But we have the RSP, the TFSA, taxable personal accounts, and for physicians in many cases, also corporate uh, taxable investment accounts. I'm not going to do a deep dive on that. Uh, there's an upcoming session with uh, J Jacob Molosic, who will, will do a bit of a deeper dive on, uh, on those specifics. For the RSP and TFSA, uh, the RSP is referred to as a tax deferred account and it's tax deferred because when you make a contribution to the RRSP, you can reduce your taxable income in that tax year by the amount of the contribution. It's kind of neat. It's important if you have a high tax bracket as an individual, because every dollar that you put into the RRSP account uh, reduces your taxable income. You can even deduct yourself with RRSP contributions out of the higher tax brackets, depending on what your income is. So it can be very useful as a tax planning tool. When you take money out of the RSP in the future, generally speaking at retirement, you pay tax on the withdrawal. That's why it's tax deferred. You don't pay income tax on the dollars that you put in the RSP, but you do pay tax on the withdrawals. To get RSP room, you have to have uh, earned income. For most people that's salary, this becomes very relevant for anybody that has a corporation because if you're only paying yourself uh, dividends out of your corporation, you're not accruing any RSP room. You have to be paying yourself salary. Now, again, that's a slightly more complex tax planning topic that um, uh, would be a, a good thing to ask Jacob Molosic about when he does his session. That's the, the salary versus dividends discussion. Uh, the TFSA, is it's kind of like the inverse of the RSP. So with the RSP, because you can deduct the contributions from your income, you're effectively making contributions with uh, pre-tax income. So you, you receive your income, effectively you don't pay tax on it, it and go straight into the RSP account. The TFSA, you're making contributions with after-tax income. So you, you earn your income, you pay income tax, those after-tax dollars can then go in the TFSA. Because it works that way, when you make a withdrawal in the future, you don't pay tax. So it, if, if your tax rate is identical now, and at the time that you make a withdrawal from the account, the RSP and TFSA actually give you the exact same after-tax result. If your tax rate's lower in the future, the RSP gives you a better result than the TFSA. That's a very broad overview. There are a lot of other decisions that go into which account to use and 
and when. Um, but I, I hope that that is somewhat useful in thinking about it. Um, one of the last things I want to cover is the housing decision. So we've talked about investing and the fact that you can earn positive returns by investing in stocks. This relates, believe it or not, directly to the decision about how to pay for housing. Um, one of the myths, myths that I've enjoyed busting uh, the most is, is the idea that renting is throwing money away. I don't think that's true. Um, rent is an unrecoverable cost that you pay for housing. You give money to a landlord, you get a house, you don't get anything in return. Owners, and this is the piece that I think gets missed often, owners also have unrecoverable costs. Uh, they pay property tax, maintenance costs, they have high cash flow expenses um, from their, their mortgage payment and their property tax and their maintenance costs combined, and they have a cost of capital. And this is where the investing piece ties into the housing decision. If you put a $100,000 down payment on a home, or say you buy a house cash, buy a, a, a million dollar home in cash, all of that cash is in a real estate asset, which is gonna grow at the expected return of real estate, which historically, and this is sometimes hard to, um, hard to remember considering what real estate prices in Canada have done recently, um, but historically real estate around the world going back to 1900 has appreciated at about 1% in excessive inflation. So the expected returns on real estate assets are lower than the expected returns on stocks. Um, so based on that, when you're calculating the total cost of owning a home, the cost of capital, the cost of putting that money into a real estate asset instead of putting in stocks becomes one of the biggest costs for a, a homeowner. And that gets increasingly true the more equity that you have in the home as opposed to, um, as opposed to financing the home with, with debt where you don't have that same cost of equity um, issue. So I've run the numbers on this. I've got a YouTube video where I do a bit of a deep dive on, on running those numbers. Uh, but a renter who's taking the difference in total unrecoverable costs between renting and owning um, and investing that difference in stocks can expect a similar net worth outcome to an owner. Now, time period specific, if you followed this advice as, as I myself have um, for the last five or so years, um, you might wish that you'd bought real estate in, in many places in Canada, not, not all, because real estate prices have appreciated so much. But on expectations about the future, I don't think that's a, a reasonable belief to expect to continue. Um, I, I have a little bit more information to cover on investor biases, but I'm just gonna go through it quickly because I know we're running out of time and I wanna make room for questions. Um, the individual investors are uh, the, in, in the data, uh, in, individual investors are really bad at, uh, at investing, uh, on average, they underperform the market. Um, the reg main regulatory uh, body in Canada for, uh, in investment institutions just published, this, uh, uh, some data showing that, um, in January and December or between January and December so for, the, for the year in 2020, Canadians opened 2.3 million new investment accounts at discount brokerages, um, which is uh, much higher than it has been historically. And if anyone's been paying attention to what's happening, been happening in the financial markets recently, um, you might understand why. There's been a lot of speculation by, by individual investors picking stocks. Um, most investors, and this is from US survey data, uh, most investors get their information from the internet, um, followed closely by their friends. Um, so that, that, that may contribute to the on average poor performance of individual, individual investors. Some of the other big factors there are overconfidence. So I'm, I'm saying this and, uh, statistically, a lot of you are saying that, you know, you're different <laughs> that, that doesn't tend to be true though. Uh, individual investors tend to chase performance. So we talked about buying a fund that's done well in the past, not leading to good performance in the future. A lot of investors do that with both funds and stocks. A lot of individual investors in the data have a preference for skewness. So the, the idea that I mentioned that a few, a few stocks explain most of the market's returns, um, so some people actually want that. They're, they're willing to buy the lottery ticket, which is effectively what's happening. So an investor with a preference for skewness is gonna have bad returns on average, but a few of those investors are gonna do extremely well because they effectively win the lottery. And then one of the other big ones is that individual investors tend to fail to 
diversify. So this leads to the question, if the internet and friends aren't the best sources of information, where should you go? Uh, there are online firms in Canada now that charge a relatively low fee. They'll take your assets, invest them for you and give you some advice. In some cases, they have no minimums, like Wealthsimple is, a, is an obvious example, They're the largest one that, or at least they, they market the most. Um, there are also fee-for-service financial advisors in Canada. Those are people who you can pay a, an hourly fee or a fixed uh, dollar amount to, and they'll sit down with you, look at your overall situation, and give you financial advice. There are asset allocation ETFs, which are these amazing products that have come out in the last five years, even maybe last three years. These are uh, ETFs, which is a type of fund that you can invest in one product. And that one product actually gives you exposure to a globally diversified portfolio of index funds, which when we talk about an in investing in index funds, that's exactly what you want. So I call that embedded advice because you buy this product and the advice, the portfolio advice is built into the product. Um, and then lastly, there are fee-based firms. So that's what I do, full, full disclosure, conflict of interest and, and so on. There are firms that will take your investment assets, invest them for you, preferably in a portfolio of index funds, um, and give you advice on your overall situation. Um, the, the firms like ours, unfortunately, don't tend to be as accessible because we charge a percentage of assets. We have relatively high asset minimums, um, which is just an unfortunate reality of, of the business and of paying for the qualified people to give the advice and, and all that um, and all that good stuff. Now. Importantly, the contrast between a fee-based firm, like I just mentioned, is a commission-based firm or a commission-based financial advisor. Uh, a majority of the financial advisors in Canada are commission-based, meaning that they sell products and earn commissions from selling those products, and that's how they're paid for their advice. I, I, I wouldn't go to a commission-based financial advisor as a source of information. Um, I, I wouldn't buy products from them. The reason is there's there's this massive inherent conflict of interest. Index funds, which I've talked about as making sense for most people to invest in, they don't pay commissions. So a commission-based financial advisor is, well, they have a conflict of interest. They're, they're, they're required to sell actively managed funds in, er, in order to earn an income, which is a problem uh, for, for obvious reasons. So uh, to, to hand everything off um, to, to a firm to manage things for you, the number one thing to look for there is a, is a fee-based firm. But the problem being they have higher minimums in, until you've met that minimum, some combination of asset allocation ETFs, an online robo-advisor and fee-only financial planning advice are probably the best path to getting good information and, and making better decisions. Uh, that's it. Sorry, I went a little long.